Presenting Chris Gilsbeck, track and guest of honor for 2017, composer, music designer, and an artist of several <laughs> areas. Uh, this will be an interview uh, detailing career uh, accomplishments and some interesting anecdotes from along the way. Hi. <laughs> Uh, we had a few problems getting the examples and photos and stuff like that ready, so that will be interesting because we're now accessing the Dropbox from the web interface, but uh, let's hope it works out. Um, so, um, well, thanks for inviting me. That's all. Test, test. It sounds like there is a little bit of circulation. Uh, does it bother you? No. Okay. no. Okay, you're, he you're hearing all right. Yes. Great. For now. <laughs> Just let me know. Raise both of your hands up if you can't hear. Okay, so uh, why don't we, like nowadays, you live in the US, you're working as a freelancer, traveling the uh, country by RV, but it's been a long road there. So why don't we start in the beginning? So, Germany. Yeah, I uh, was born in 1968 into a musical family. Um, my grandma was an accomplished piano teacher, and uh, so we had always pianos in the house. And so I was brought up with music. Uh, I even had some piano lessons from her when I was five, but uh, I s um, stopped after about two years because she was too old school for me. She would hit her students with a stick if uh, they made mistakes, and I didn't like that. I also wasn't that interested in classical music. I became interested in electronic music. Um, in my early teenager years, I was a fan of uh, Kraftwerk and Tangerine Dream and um, Jean-Michel Jarre, Vangelis, to name a few. Uh, and yeah. Many things, and I know that your own gaming led you to gaming music. But how did you find out how to make music on Commodore 64 and later Amiga? Yeah, the reason that I actually got the Commodore 64 uh, was because I wanted to own a synthesizer, but my family didn't have the money to purchase such expensive um, electronic music equipment. And one day I read in a magazine that the Commodore 64 had a real synthesizer sound chip and I wanted a computer anyway because I was a little bit of a, a video game addict. Um, so it seemed to be like covering everything that I wanted, that I was interested in at the time. So I saved up money and with the help of uh, some, someone from my grandma I got a Commodore 64. And but that doesn't come with any kind of programming for creating music. It's just inputting numbers, just numbers and numerous amounts of numbers. Correct. Way in the beginning, uh, I mean, when you switch on the Commodore 64, it's nothing like today when you buy a Windows PC or something that already has pre-made software that, can, that you can use. So switch it on and nothing happens. And, um, so I needed to learn programming, and I did, and uh, ultimately um, even assembly language, because uh, I also wanted to become a game designer and program my own games and stuff. Um, but it turned out that I wasn't that great at that, um, but my programming was good enough to finally do music with the C64. And a friend of mine had um, already sold the game to a company, he was much better. And he was working on a second game, and that's when I uh, made my first game into the memory confinement in the folder there. In, um, and then I was in the shorts. And there should be one that says like Planet of War. Yeah, that's the one. Let's see if, Let's see if that works. My very first game. Shape 
James was a little was bit later, like maybe one and a half, one, well, maybe one, two years later, maybe I was 16 even when I did this. So, like around that time. And Shades was really the music piece that put me on the map. And it was a contest in a German magazine called 64 Magazine. And um, uh, so I programmed a new player that had more capabilities than this and made a piece, sent it in with the hope just to get on that cover disc that had like 10 people. And to my surprise, I won the contest. And um, that player was already much more advanced and we have a demo of that too. Shades, C64 Shades, I think it says in here. digitized it later and, and, and preserved it. So uh, if you want to play that, so that was me like 10 years old at a first organ piece. <laughs> exactly what I was doing, but I got something interesting, it's like the second organ piece, if you see that somewhere. And that sounds already a lot more like for the direction of the story. something the organ would do by itself. That was because I made these circuit bending before that was even a term. And then a couple couple months later I continued doing it and the organ blew up. So I, I overdid it. I don't have a recording of that unfortunately. So but back to shades and um, So you actually want something with it? Yeah, I won a prize, and... Um, but you didn't expect to win it. Right. And uh, right after the editor from the magazine was very interested in how, how could he do this music, I had only... He said I had only heard something like that from Breton, from Rob Hubbard, and stuff, and he was, he was fascinated and had me on the phone for hours to explain how I do it, and uh, it's very complicated with writing hexadecimal numbers into memory and he was like tuning out after some point and uh, I thought already or I had thought already about making an editor that makes this data entry easier and uh, when I told him about it he said like oh my our sister magazine uh, Happy Computer would 
print that as a listing of demands if I do something that makes it easy to create this music with the C64. And that became the sound monitor, uh, which uh, in the uh, scene is now regarded as kind of the grandfather of uh, sound trackers, uh, trackers in general. And we have a screenshot, I think, if you go back. Um, go probably back to the um, directory. I think you have to go up. very uh, technical to explain what's going on there, but um, it made the music entry already so much easier, and that uh, became listing of the months. And by the way, it was the two, just as a small anecdote on the side, was the two prices from the um, shades and from the sound monitor, I bought myself an Amiga, and I think I was the second person in the whole area that owned one. Um, and I didn't do anything with it until about two years later, uh, except uh, look at beautiful things and marvel at it. Uh, but I still kept working on the C64 for a while. Yeah. There's, there's my later incarnation of sound tools on the Amiga, and we're going to talk about that too. So. Yeah, so uh, was it soon after this that you were working on recruited by the infamous Rainbow Arts? Yes, in fact, uh, after I won Shades, even before I had the uh, sound monitor done, I called up um, Rainbow Arts, which was the, um, one of the bigger developers in Germany starting up, um, because they had like put ads in the magazines that they're looking for people, and I said, hey, I'm doing music, I won this contest. And, played the uh, owner of the company something over the phone and says, when can you start? <laughs> so I, um, I actually uh, skipped the last one and a half years of school because there was like the higher grades there that uh, prepared you for um, university and I didn't want to go there anyway. So uh, I started working for Rainbow Arts and um, yeah. Then there were some happenings with uh the great Jack oh, yeah, yeah. and uh, the R type copy, which actually gave you some good news. Yes, so um, Rainbow Arts in the beginning had some pretty basic projects that um, nobody was really interested in, uh, but I, I started making music for them, and then uh, a couple months in, the owner saw the excitement about Mario Brothers. Uh, which was not available in Germany at the time, but uh, the magazines had it. And they uh, were so excited about it, they printed articles and uh, gave it the highest ratings. And he looked at that and said, like, Rainbow Arts could do something like that in a few weeks. And, um, and uh, so on the way back, um, he called everybody in the uh, meeting room and said, we're making a game like Mario Brothers, you know. Like, just change some things, but uh, you know, it was basically a rip-off. And uh, they said, instead of brothers, we'll make it sisters, and uh, what's like an um, Italian-sounding female name, and he came up with the... Gianna Nannini was the singer at the time that he was a fan of. So he said, oh, and call it the Gianna sisters. And then, yeah, little side anecdote that I always like to bring up, in the menu of the C64, it's written with two N, and that's how the singer is written. But um, our screwy cover artist, who was external, he made a mistake and put on the cover was one N. <laughs> and that's how it became the Jayana sisters. And, uh, you know, it was too late to change, so they left it. 
And then Nintendo threatened to sue a couple of months later, uh, because they saw it in England, where they had a presence, and the English distributor like took it up a notch and actually teased Nintendo in their marketing campaign and said like, the brothers are history and <laughs> stuff like that. And they did not like that. So um, they threatened a lawsuit and uh, at that time it had already made quite some money for Rainbow Arts and they didn't want to deal with it, so they took it off the market uh, and continued on. But the music in those were not inspired by Super Mario Brothers. They were your original compositions. Right. Uh, except for the level design, which is almost a carbon copy of Mario Brothers, and uh, some of the graphics, which are heavily inspired, the music was unique. So, and and, uh, and gained quite a following. So, a um, lot of fans out there. Uh, was this close to the time period when you started experimenting with orchestral versions? <laughs> Nowhere near. At that time, I could have not dreamed that that would even happen at some point. That didn't happen until the mid-2000s. Oh, so it was only sample sounds? Yeah, not even. I, um, yeah, this comes, this is actually part of our type, the story of our type. So we did another game a couple of months after. Uh, Joanna's sister is called Katakis, which was a total rip-off of R-Type, the arcade game. Uh, yeah, you know, I mean, it worked once, why not twice? <laughs> so, <laughs> and they did it, and uh, it was well received uh, until the, again, British distributor from, uh, that, that, that got an R-Type name and wanted to make an R-Type game on the C64 and Amiga. Um, they saw this, and again, like, were pissed and wanted to sue and whatever, but ultimately it worked out really nice because um, they couldn't get it together themselves. They were not technically proficient enough to make a good art type. And ultimately they offered, okay, Raymond's going to do art type. Um, uh, you take Katakis off the market and change some graphics, rename it, and then we're even. So that's how we uh, were able to make our type, which was a dream come true for us, actually, because we loved the game. And um, I did a title music for the Amiga version that also became quite famous. Um, and that's the one that used a more cinematic approach instead of what I did for the C64, which was more synth-based. Um, and uh, yeah, the arcade version did not have title music, so that's why the C64 and the Amiga have uh, different title music. Um, and uh, we have that then too, R type and Amiga somewhere. Okay. Yeah. Matthew? Yeah. Uh, so this 
I moved on to the Amiga and I created an, another sound tool which was actually based on the follow-up system uh, of the sound monitor. I had done another one on the C64 called TFMX. And the new thing about that was that um, I was unhappy with the way a sound monitor and many other systems were using to, cr to create the single sounds, which was a fixed set of parameters. And that was always like limited to what I had originally programmed. And if I wanted a new effect or something, I had to go back and program again. So with the TFMX system, I um, invented something called a sound, that I call sound macros which is like a, a simple scripting language, um, very simple commands with uh, also like um, programming features like loops and weights and stuff like that. So you could uh, run a little script each time you trigger a node and that would enhance the capabilities of the sound engine while you're composing the music. So you could like decide, okay, I want to do something crazy here and make a a complex sound macro and that would enhance the capabilities of the sound engine in real time there. And that same concept I ported over to the Amiga and that's also used here and was used in this R-type uh, piece. Uh, in the beginning you heard these samples that almost sounded like they were playing backwards. That was not something that the Amiga could do but because of the TFMX system you could take like a snippet loop it quickly and move it like backwards over the over all the waves and that would create that effect like, kind of a little bit like a granular synthesis type of thing, very simple. But um, yeah, and I did a lot of other productions with TFMX. Among the most famous ones are the Turrican series um, and particularly Turrican 2, which um, used another enhancement where I expanded the number of voices you could use. So I had a friend in the business who was like total programming crazy guru. Uh, he worked on the Atari ST, his name is Jochen Hippel. And he made an Amiga emulation of the Amiga sound chip on the Atari ST. And um, I had thought for quite some time to maybe use the CPU of the Amiga to mix channels and I had actually seen one other that was a tracker, the Octolizer or something was called that had eight voices uh, it would always like calculate two and two and two and two on each of the four Amiga channels and then that way create eight voices and they all sounded shitty <laughs> so uh, I uh, thought about this and when I saw Jochen's very efficient code on the Atari ST, I thought like, okay, why don't I take that and just output that on one voice of the Amiga and then whatever degrades there I use for like um, samples that were not that important, maybe drum sounds and bass sounds and stuff like that, but I still have like three pristine Amiga voices left over for anything that needed higher fidelity. So that became the seven voice system TFMX and the most famous piece is Torican 2 intro or title. Um, I don't know if you see that somewhere there. Turned out to be a very significant piece that you worked on. Um, how was it working on something like that? 
Yeah, so uh, at the time I didn't quite know it, what it would become, but um, it was probably one of those projects that I had most fun with, um, because uh, I had total freedom, so nobody told me what to come up with there. I worked closely with the team, um, playing the game almost every day, and um, I thought like, okay, this is a kind of like a fast, action type game where you shoot a lot but it's also like exploration and um, we were also at the time really inspired by Japanese arcade stuff still and um, so I thought like okay this has to be kind of like synthesizer rock which is also going back to my original wish of like working with synthesizers so it was really like the perfect, uh, everything came together perfectly for this game and it's probably my, my best known work to date and um, it has spawned quite of um, um, uh, yeah, new releases of it, including orchestra which we're getting to uh, a little bit later. Uh, soon after that you left Rainbow Arts and founded a company with some of your friends. Right, uh, so after a few years the company took a different direction and they were more into making deals with other companies to license stuff and distribute it in Germany and um, they did not quite support the vision of the creative people in there so they left one by one. I remember like one of the guys, uh, Thomas Kreisler, he founded Blue Byte and uh, so I eventually left and founded uh, my own company with two friends, uh, Kaiko, um, and uh, we did um, two games until the company unfortunately folded a couple years later, but uh, one of them also became quite famous, that was Apedia on the Amiga, and uh, again, like very heavy inspired by Japanese um, arcade games. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if I have a sample of that, but maybe we'll... Yeah, no, that's okay. Uh, that might be something we're also going to revisit this orchestra one day. It has already been included on the 2008 album. Um, a little bit featured there. Uh, then there was something in between before working on Turk and the second uh, about uh, TFNX7 was yeah that, that I already covered yeah. um, was the um, and enhancements um, Turk 2 and GemX yeah GemX was the first game of Kaiko um, uh, also got a cute soundtrack it's the game is not that I mean it's like a Japanese inspired puzzle game uh, but um, yeah the music was so good that um, the producer of my 2008 uh, concert um, was also a big fan of my music, included it in the concert. And actually, um, a Finnish guy um, made the arrangement, uh, Jana Valton, and uh, he will be in the panel tomorrow. Yeah, yeah. he has also That's seen us. a guest on the Yeah, and um, it did an amazing rendition of that tune. and. Um, Unfortunately, I don't have a demo of that here, but you can probably find it on YouTube. Um, yeah. uh, so what came after that? I mean, your career started really, really going, but you were still in Germany. Yeah, we started to move on to actually console games. Uh, so switch systems again away from the Amiga, I went on, on to Super Nintendo, which was really nice to work uh, with because um, I was still making the music on the Amiga, but it was easy to port over because it had eight voices on the sound chip anyway. So I made seven voice compositions and had still a channel left over for sound effects that you always hear and stuff like that. So uh, it was easy to work with and um, nice. We did Super Tarek and Super Tarek 2. And then um, a whole bunch of others, including the Sega Genesis Mega Drive, uh, where we did Mega Turrican, and that was a very uh, interesting system to work with because it had um, three different ways of generating sound. Uh, one was an FM chip that was built in, 
And then it had um, for the compatibility with the Sega Master system cartridges, it had the original PSG, which was something a little bit like the SID chip, but more simple. And then it also could output some samples, but only normally only one channel. But um, with the help of Factor 5 uh, programmer Thomas Engel, we found out how to mix two voices using the Z80 chip on the um, Genesis, which you're not supposed to do, but we did it anyway. <laughs> um, that was the chip that was in there for the master system cartridges, and we ran it at the same time, so it's like multi-processing, uh, and it actually was approved by uh, Sega ultimately, but in the original um, documentation it said you're not supposed to use that, which I wrote there. We're wondering if that heats up the machine or something, I don't know, but we did it and it became like a 12 voice system that way, um, which was nice. It was also very challenging to program that because FM sound chips are uh, quite difficult to get good sounds out of, but um, it was a fun project for me. Yeah. Off-roading a little, uh, did it change your work style moving from three place sound uh, chips to seven or eight slots? I mean, um, it sounds very different, like dividing the songs up to those. No, for me it was just like, oh, I could do more. And that was always the driving point for it, you know, you were always looking for the next thing, which one is better. And of course I could have, I could have uh, probably created 20, 40 channel music if I had the capabilities. And so it was a progression, uh, which is also, I mean, nowadays, um, you know, game music is produced like any other music in the studio. Um, often with live musicians and even big orchestras, so uh, it's very different from those early days. Um, yeah, much, much easier now. I'm guessing the size of the studio has also compacted. Uh, well, that's kind of like, um, if, if we're moving forward to, to the now, and from about 2001 onwards, well, let me, let me go back to the mid-90s, I actually had a pretty sizable studio by then, with lots of machinery, a large mixing desk, and tons of cables, and, and, and you know, I was looking like sitting in a spaceship, which was nice, I, I, I really enjoyed that time, but it was also um, kind of like, first of all, it was expensive still to put that all together, and to maintain it was sometimes tricky, and then um, if you had finished the song and you were moving on to the next one, you would often lose all your settings. I mean, you started from scratch and then if you would go like back a couple months later, it was very difficult to recreate the sound that you had because all the machines had changed, you had like loaded up new sounds, maybe made different connections or the mixer was totally different. And um, so, in 2000, 2001, Steinberg introduced the um, VST revolution, which moved everything again back into the computer one by one. Uh, everything could be simulated with a strong, powerful PC, and you had uh, recreations of um, all those classic synthesizers and stuff like that in your machine on the screen, and with um, one button push, you could save everything on the drive and then load it up months later and it would be identical as you left it before. And for me that was amazing and gradually I reduced my uh, studio again to, and now I work on a laptop. Uh, the laptop is right there. This is what I've used for the last few years. It's, it's pretty powerful. Um, it's got a lot of memory and stuff, but um, I can do more with this and, and by a large factor than what I could do in the mid-90s in that studio with all the expensive machinery. So, uh, and that also enabled me to change my lifestyle. Uh, you, you mentioned it in the beginning, but we might get back to that a little bit. 
uh, I now live actually fully mobile in a motor home and travel the US. I decided um, about two years ago that uh, living in a house in the San Francisco Bay Area was kind of boring. I was kind of, I felt kind of stuck there. I hadn't seen that much of the US, even living there for 18 years. And I decided, okay, you know, do I really need all this stuff and the house and the big garage that was also filled up with junk? And uh, finally um, worked towards that, reduced all the clutter and reduced really to the life to, to what's essential. And so I travel around now. I have a nice workspace there. I, uh, I don't know if I have that link there, but um, uh, it's, it's not there, I think. Uh, if you, you know, have a Do you want me picture. to pull up the website? Uh, yeah, but I don't know if I find it like, is find it easy. It's on um, Tri Theta 360 slash, um, slash C underscore Hillsburg, maybe. Try that. I don't know, it's just like an uh, yeah, idea. Like Work on dash, but it's C underscore. Might be faster. We had some trouble transferring the stuff over earlier. Okay, well, uh, let me just describe it. So it's a motorhome, so it's about 30 feet long, and it's got, uh, it's got a bedroom, it's got a kitchen, and it's got an area that's normally used for dining, but I made like a work desk, and... Um, oh, something? Yeah, oh, there it is, yeah. So click on that and then make it big. The second icon on the right is the one that makes it really big. And then you can zoom in by using the mouse wheel in the middle. <coughs> so, uh, yeah, so you, you see that a little bit. But the interesting part is the studio. Um, and uh, yeah, I can, I can do anything there. And it's very inspiring because you move that motorhome where you want. I have solar on the roof, so I'm not depending on any um, hookups or anything. I can stay for a week out in the wilderness if I want and just have like a nice landscape outside the window. And, yeah. We can also like, uh, if you guys have questions. Yeah, I think uh, Apedia uh, was where we left off in, in the timeline. Maybe we should jump ahead to, uh, okay, let's do like a, a little history lesson from the mid 90s. So um, I was freelancing for a while and Factor 5, the company that did Tarkin, they moved uh, to the US in 96 and um, asked me in late 97 if I want to join them for a Star Wars game that they were working on uh, because it was one of the last um, uh, Nintendo consoles that did not have a CD drive so it was cartridge based, the Nintendo 64 and they needed somebody who could um, crunch kind of like Star the original Star Wars music and some new music as well into that cartridge and that I have some sample for that too but um, that became the Star Wars Rogue Squadron series and uh, I think I have that's where it was that's right. Rogue, Rogue Squadron yeah. so that was on the N64 was about 20 voices <laughs>
So you, you can hear a little bit the <laughs> progression of um, the sound. That's like the last kind of um, projects where I used MIDI and samples together that kind of like similar to the tracker principle and then everything moved on to um, kind of like MP3s and streaming audio, all that, that kind of stuff. You moved to US to work on this? Uh, in early 98 I joined them in the US. I was originally planned for a year, but um, I liked it so much and they liked working with me, so eventually I stayed and um, been there ever since. Uh, then there was the Bill 7.1 of the Surround Studio. Right, so in, um, in the mid-2000s we decided to build a studio dedicated to 7.1 Surround Sound. Again, like another thing to push the envelope and make the sound better and we had that uh, THX certified, I don't know why, I have a picture of that, I think. Um, and then, uh, and it's very unfortunate, we just got this studio done, and two years later, the company folded, and uh, a couple months later, they ripped that studio out of the building. Um, it's probably... Anyway, so kind of kind of sad, and also, um, well, at that point um, I decided that I'm done with that kind of way of working, and um, that also kind of fueled my uh, wish of doing everything virtual and reduce uh, reduce it to the basics and really concentrate on the music. I mean, at some point. Um, you're like surrounding yourself with all this machinery and stuff like that and the, the creativity sometimes suffers and uh, so I'm actually I'm actually happy how this all turned out um, but yeah sometimes I miss it a little bit sitting in that beautiful room anyway um, so basically I think we can move on to the to that orchestra stuff that happened uh, the first ever symphony concert? Yeah, that was actually in 2008, uh, the, the year where Factor 5 folded, I had um, one of my the nicest experiences of my career. Uh, uh, <laughs> there was a fan of mine in Germany, his name is Thomas Berger. And um, he used to write me letters when he was a teenager and telling me that he was my biggest fan, and I got quite a few of those letters, so I, you know, like, okay, it's nice, all right. Um, and then uh, we got in contact again, so this was like in the early 90s, and then we got in touch again in the early 2000s, when I was already in the US, and he said he's um, preparing some orchestra thing in um, Leipzig with the games convention which was a large game show, and uh, asked me if I, if I would give one of my pieces um, to play there, and I, of course I said yes. And um, so he made this concert, and then more followed the following years, and then he eventually took it to the next level, and uh, yeah, got me a gig, or an, in, in my honor, a concert with the a WDR, which is a German radio station, it's state funded. Um, they have their own orchestra to play a full concert with my music. And that was Symphonic Shades at the uh, end of 2008. And uh, I was sitting there in the audience uh, uh, watching this and hearing the music, and I had like tears running down my che cheeks constantly. Uh, it was absolutely mind blowing. And again, like uh, Jan Walton was doing most of the arrangements there. We also had guest arrangers Yuzu Koshiro, which is a huge name in Japan and one of my uh, favorite idols there. And um, another um, um, arranger and uh, yeah, it was, was a beautiful thing. And a CD came out of it. Uh, it's sold out by now, but you can still listen to it on iTunes and everywhere, Spotify, 
band camp. Uh, the music lives on. And uh, yeah. Uh, was this uh, after this that you founded your own company, Chris Wolfsbeck uh, Productions? Yeah. Actually, that's just like a continuation of what I had done in Germany. So um, in Germany, I had a uh, my own company, Chris Wilsbeck Media Production, and um, then I worked for Factor 5, and then the company folded, so I went back freelancing and kind of re resurrected that in the US, and that became Chris Wilsbeck Productions, and um, been outputting a lot of albums over the years, you know, like preserving the uh, work that I've done and also um, enhancing it and making it better. And of course, a huge part of that is still Tarakan and to this day, I don't want to do it forever, but uh, we actually just recorded last week in Sweden the second album of orchestra music from Tarakan. And I have a little video of that, so not, not many people have seen this yet. I was in North Shopping. Let's see if we Absolutely fantastic orchestra, and um, as I said, this is the uh, second one of these uh, productions. The first one was last year, also in North Shopping, and um, yeah, that one was also very well received. And um, you have a couple of copies downstairs at the uh, track, on track on desk, yeah. So if you're interested, you pick that up. Um, I would appreciate it. <laughs> Uh, but you also were part of some rather successful iPhone-based mobile games. A long list. Interesting that, uh, yeah, we're jumping back a little bit. Uh, in uh, what was that, 2010 or so, I did, um, I did music for Zombie Smash, which was, you know, one of those early game, small game apps, uh, which uh, became a number one uh, seller on the uh, iTunes App Store for I think a couple days, and uh, they they were very happy about that. I was happy about it, and um, yeah, uh, little milestones. And I still do music to this day on video games. I actually just um, signed on for a indie project called Tiny Tor, like or Thor, like the. Nordic, uh, yeah, Nordic God, and um, it's uh, it's it's retro styled. It comes out on Steam and I think also on console eventually, and it will be released early next year. And I'm doing music for that and a bunch of other projects that are ongoing. Um, yeah. uh, so then you were also recognized for your work. You received a lifetime award from uh, the Game Audio Net Quil Net Guild. Network Guild, yeah, yes. that's an American organization to, um, to you know, push game music and game audio forward. Uh, so they're a little bit like the Grammys, but obviously much smaller. Uh, and they gave me in 2011 a Lifetime Achievement Award. And I was very honored, but I also got up there and said, like, wait a second, you know, this is normally something that people get at the end of their life. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm not quite done yet, so they were laughing, and, uh, yeah, but I, I, it's, it's cool, yeah, that was a nice recognition. And it was mostly due to the fact that I pushed the game audio on the C64 and Amiga in the early days.
yeah, we're almost up to the current day. You uh, then you just you worked on more Turrican and also Doctor Who. I've, I've done almost all um, sci-fi franchises now. I did a puzzle game on uh, mobile platforms with the Doctor Who um, franchise and made new music for that, which was fun because I'm quite a fan of the uh, TV shows and the music that they produce, including actually one of the very first uh, electronic compositions that were ever commercially created was the Doctor Who theme. And um, I saw a documentary about it, which is amazing. They they recorded the single sounds onto uh, tapes because they could they didn't have a keyboard playing them. They actually uh, recorded the different pitches on tapes, and then they cut and pasted them together, with like literally taping them. And uh, that created then the sequence that you hear, like that, that bass line. Da -da -da -dum, da -da -da -dum, da -dum, that, that's what they did, was all like little snippets. Uh, so, must have been super tedious work, even more tedious than working in a tracker. Um, yeah, but that's cool. And uh, then we're at the piano collection and uh, the newest Turkin orchestral album. Which we just saw the preview, but also I have to say thank you again for the concert last night, which was uh, really amazing. And um, yeah, that was a project I did um, three, years, three years ago with uh, friends of mine, um, one amazing keyboarder and pianist uh, from Germany, who's also a fan of my music, and uh, his name is Patrick Nevian. And we decided to um, uh, make this album kind of in chronologically ordered about the first 10 years of my career um, all solo piano pieces, uh, really nicely arranged. And then on top of that, um, we created a uh, scorebook that has like not only the scores that are on the CDs, but also beginner's versions. And for each piece, there's like a, a snippet of information there, a page of text, which is kind of similar to what we're talking about today, but in some cases goes in a little bit more detail and that became the biographical scorebook, which coincidentally is also sold out. We, we did, for all these projects, we did crowdfunding, um, which was really the only way to make these projects possible because um, you cannot go in a bank and tell them something about a piano collection or Tarek and music record with an orchestra. It just doesn't work, uh, but thanks to probably a few guys here and um, thousands of other fans out there, these projects came to life and um, have made the fans happy and uh, me, of course, too. And uh, yeah, so thank you. And uh, yeah. Uh, but you do have plans for the future as well. Uh, do I? <laughs> Always, yeah. Uh, I don't know. Uh, can you give me a hint? <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, that's actually that's actually part of this latest orchestral album that I'm doing. It's kind of like a farewell to the um, Tarek and remake um, situation because. Um, we feel like until a new Tarakan is made, um, we've done enough. You know, we've done like a really nice collection doing it in the studio, we've done it with orchestra. Uh, but for this latest one, which we're still taking pre-orders for, by the way, um, if you go to tarakansoundtrack.com, you can find the links. Um, we're also doing a bonus album, which I'm actually doing with the original Amiga TFMX. So it's kind of like a virtual Tarakan 4 um, soundtrack, and it's created in the original sound tool, will be recorded on original hardware, and then put out on the second disc as a bonus. Uh, yeah. And it's a fun project. Oh yeah, and I have a demo for that too.
possibility for the Yeah, that too, but it, this is only a demo, so it will be enhanced. But uh, this is like uh, one of the suggestions that we collected from fans was for worlds for this virtual targeting game that doesn't exist but in our minds and uh, they a lot of them had like a, a, they wanted like a jungle theme so that's why we have a little bit of the jungle right in the background but, so an alien jungle if you will but um, you know it's got the typical uh, target melodies that you can remember and stuff like that and the these are also like made with four voices, so they could be played in game if there was a new game on the Amiga. Uh, the title music and the credits and stuff like that, that will all be done in seven voice, of course. So I'm staying true to the original idea. Good point, you must have picked that up earlier because uh, I mentioned that I, a couple of years ago I vowed to not make music for uh, violent games, ultra-violent games, particularly, um, you know, like war simulations. I'm not a fan of that. I don't mind if somebody plays it, but I don't want to make music for that. Uh, but it's still okay if it has some like fantastical or science fiction style. Yeah, if it's, so. if it's science fiction or horror or something, I'm fine with it. I'm just not into the whole warfare simulation you know, where it's like really like graphics. So. Uh, then do you have a favorite type of uh, game to create for? <laughs> Well, um, definitely my, my most favorite game of the last years or a couple of years has been the Portal series, Portal 1 and 2, because it takes actually that first person shooter feeling and does something uh, different with it and I really enjoyed playing those. And, um, I, you know, they don't have that much music in them but I still would have been honored if I could have made sound for those because it's pretty nice what they've done. I think this is the point where we inquire whether there is audience questions. Any questions? We have a portable mic, so lift your hand up and we'll try to not hit your head. <laughs> Hello. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for coming here and thank you for the talk. Uh, just one question that if there's, I don't know if there's 10 year olds people, 10 year olds here at the moment, but one tip or advice from you to someone who's interested about making music, what would, what would that advice be? Just get started. I mean, there's so many um, good programs out there these days where you can, um, where you can play around with music. You can, you could start on, on an iPhone or an iPad and do really amazing things and just uh, I think the most important thing is that you enjoy what you're doing and you're exploring and you're enhancing your uh, skills and stuff like that. And then once you get like really serious and you, you, um, you realize you have talent for it or something, then there's also a lot of programs nowadays that were not available back then. Um, you can, since it's, I mentioned it's like regular music production, you can, um, you know, study music, uh, could maybe even go to conservatory or something like that. Um, I'm, I'm self-taught, but I was also at a time when, you know, there was, nobody could teach us what we were doing. So um, I was lucky that way. But today there's, there's a lot of possibilities to, to get started in the business. And there was a, no? For coming here, my question is, who is your favorite video composer? Uh, well, there's a bunch. Definitely Yuzo Koshiro. Um, I really enjoy him. Uh, I also think Jasper Kid is amazing. Um, he did the uh, Assassin's Creed series. And um, there's a bunch of other ones too. I, uh, I, I don't necessarily concentrate on one composer, I just look at what's out there and listen to it and then, you know, there's it's just still like an amazing amount of game music um, that, that's 
being produced. Just like um, a couple of years ago, there was that Journey game on the PlayStation, which was what really blew me away from the concept and also from the music. Um, yeah. Yes, check, check. Okay. Thank you very much for coming here. And my question to you is that is there some, something in the game industry or game music industry that has disappointed you largely over the years and, and how may, might you change it? If you had the power. Yeah, 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 no, I think, um, I think it's all pretty good. I, I don't have any particular complaints. Um, I don't know, but if there if there would be one thing that I could maybe change would be like the rules in the US with work for hire because I really like to put out my own soundtracks and um, when you work for an American company it's often that they own everything and um, uh, I had a couple of instances where I can't share my music because of that that, that I did for American companies. I had a question. Uh, do you still actually use any tracker programs in your actual work or something like this? I do now. With yeah. the with the bonus album I used here from X, I've played around a little bit in trackers, um, but I'm I would have to um, really dig in to to do something good with it. Um, I prefer my own tools still uh, at this point, and um, there's. I mean, like my, my favorite composing tool is Steinberg Cubase, and uh, that's you know so convenient to use. Um, I, I right now can't imagine like going to a tracker just like that. Do we have to uh, stop, or can we take uh, one more question, maybe? I see like this. Yes, the. Uh, Beautiful host there going um, to check. Okay. Yes, uh, in the game Apidia, you did some pretty wild techno party rave music. <laughs> so, uh, did you ever do more of that, or was it just uh, did you plan to make something for the clubs also? Um, I, I. What you say, dabbled in it for a little bit. Uh, in the early 90s, I actually tried to make something that could potentially go into the charts. Uh, I, had a, I had actually a little project called Native Vision, which was um, a typical Eurodance um, style project with a female singer and a rapper uh, from the US. And we had some um, gigs in. in you know, discos and stuff like that. Uh, and maybe if I would have been like two years earlier or something, that could have become a hit. But by that time, the market was saturated with that kind of stuff. And uh, ultimately, I concentrated on the game music. Um, yeah, but every now and then, I have done some tracks that um, have like strong club influences. And I do like to listen to club music every now and then, for sure. We have time for one more question, but unfortunately that's it, so do we have any takers? Um, yeah, it's maybe a bit a uh, strange question, but do you think there's one game that you know or have you experienced a game you think, okay, this has been completely ruined by the music? Oh, I don't know, probably, but I can't remember right now. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, it's usually um, you um, concentrate more on the games that are really great, and uh, usually then the soundtrack also works well with it. Yeah. Thanks. But uh, thank you all so much for coming. Thank you also from my card, and let's give a big hand to.